Well, if you have your Bibles with you, turn to Proverbs chapter 3. We'll be in verses starting in verse 5 and, and following. If you don't have your Bibles with you, well, we'll have the verses up on the screen. Well, Nell and I were married six years when a friend named Larry led us both to faith in Christ. Uh, the first thing that Larry taught us was how to share our faith with others like he shared his faith with us. And the second thing that Larry taught us was about giving. And about 20 years ago, Nell and I, that was considerably more than 20 years ago, but about 20 years ago, Neil and I adopted a system that has kept us on track with our giving and has served us well for those two decades or so. It's a very unsophisticated method. Uh, it is uh, homemade, but it has served us well. And that, I started to make a nice pretty one to put up on the screen. I said, nah. I did redact a little. <laughs> But up in the top right corner is our, our bills. In each one of those boxes is a paycheck with which thing we're going to pay from that paycheck according to its date. Very, very simple. It's not very sophisticated, but uh, neither am I. So just wanted to let you know that um, at the end of this message, and by the way, if you're a guest with us today, let me, let me say right off the bat, we don't talk about money much here. But about every 18 to 24 months, we take a period of time and we teach a short series on giving. Because we know, first of all, you can, you can Google sources of marriage problems or something like that and you'll get a bunch of surveys. And usually the top several, maybe the top 10 or so, will at least have finances in the top 10 issues and, and uh, struggles in marriages. Some of them, several of them list the finances in the top five reasons. So this is an extremely important topic. When you start talking about money at church, literally some people will get up and walk out. Some people just say to themselves, that's all they ever do at church, talk about money. Well, no, it's not. But it's an extraordinary, and by the way, Jesus talked more about money than he did hell. Yeah, it's an extremely important topic and it falls to me as your pastor to do as the Bible says to teach the full counsel of God. If because of some unseen or unspoken pressure I were to hold back part of the Word of God, you and I would suffer from it and God would be dishonored by it. So as, as much as I don't like preaching on money because of the way it's often conceived, perceived, here we go, nonetheless. Well, again, the, the, the most, most important thing that that little homemade tool, and we'll tell you about the opportunity for something much better. And by the way, I put some copies of blanks over there, not with all the numbers on it, my bills, but, but some blanks on the table over there. And if you don't have a system, you need one. Let me encourage you, tear one of those off, and I'd be glad to say this is how we do it. Just very briefly, very brief description. But the most important tool, that, uh, or benefit that that tool has provided for Nell and I is not only has it helped us to keep our budget in shape, but it has taught us about giving. And it has helped us to give obediently as the Word of God commands and consistently on a, on a regular basis, all of our, uh, you know, uh, tithe, our tithe check is the first check I write every payday before we write, before we pay our bills. But, um, and the, as a result of that tool helping us to keep our finances, helping us to, to keep our giving obedient and consistent, Giving obediently and consistently has taught us to handle money as the mere thing that it is. 
Early in my Christian life, a wise man told me, and I didn't get it at the time, we were talking about helping someone. And he said, it's just money. And I actually laughed. You know, I, I snickered because I, I thought he was kidding. But he wasn't. It's just money. It's a thing. And giving obediently and consistently has helped Nell and I to learn to handle money as the mere thing that it is. The biblical model is to use money and love people, not the other way around. And learning how to handle money in a biblical fashion has, for Nell and I, helped us to be on the same page about a lot of decisions because finances are involved in a lot of the decisions that a couple makes. It has led us to avoid the pitfalls and the stress that's associated with unnecessary debt. And there's a lot of it. It has protected us. Now I want you to listen to this list. It has protected us from envy, jealousy, greed, materialism, anxiety, and self-centeredness. If there's something that can help keep us from those things, we need to know about it. And not only do we need to know about it, we need to adopt the biblical model for it. It set us free to live generously and to lay up eternal treasures as Jesus recommended. And it showed us first how, firsthand how God uses His resources to fuel His mission. And that, of course, as you know, if you were here last week, that has a lot to do with the, the series we're in about generosity. Because as you may know, we're in the, today is the second week of a four-week series called From, To, Through, For. Now, if you weren't here last week, that, that doesn't mean much at all. So let me just briefly uh, review the, the overall thrust of the little series. Uh, we're answering the question, how does God fuel His mission? And the answer is, from the Lord, that's the provision that He provides, to His people, and that has to do with our stewardship, through the church, that has to do with generosity, for the world, that has to do with mission. God's mission to reconcile men, women, boys and girls unto Himself. Last week we learned from... Uh, First Chronicles that indeed everything that is in the heavens and the earth, yours is the dominion, O Lord. Meaning that everything that exists, the Lord has dominion over it. That word, as we saw last week, means two key things. It means one, ownership. And two, authority. He has ownership over everything. I mean, after, like I said last week, after all, if He created everything, how can He not own everything? And then authority over it. But before God designed and created you and me, He provided everything we'd need for living. He provided for us spiritually with His very His own presence. He, he provided for us emotionally with, 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 with marriage, with family, with friends. He, and He provided for us physically with the world around us. But the common denominator is throughout those things that He provided. All of those things He gave to us. The principle last week was this. Everything belongs to the Lord. Pretty simple. But today we're going to focus on the second phrase and that is to His people. Has to do with stewardship. And the principle behind the biblical stewardship is that God has entrusted to me some of what belongs to Him. Extraordinarily simple process here. That God made everything and He wants to do something. So He gave us some of His stuff so we could help Him be invited into the privilege of helping Him to do what He wants to do. Reconcile men, women, boys and girls unto Himself. Well, in Matthew chapter 25, uh, Jesus was about to begin a story about, uh, 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 he was using an analogy, and he was going to uh, uh, teach about the kingdom of God. And we're not going to get into that whole teaching, but the teaching began with this verse. It says, for it, 
the kingdom of God is just like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. Now, in this story, we are the slaves, we are the servants, and God is the one who has entrusted his possessions to us. And the word entrust means that, that to deliver over to the care of someone. So, indeed, God has entrusted to us some of that which belongs to Him. Because everything belongs to Him. And He has entrusted some of that to us. And that puts us in a position of a word that we're probably familiar with, and that is stewardship. Not ownership, but stewardship. Stewardship is basically caring for that which belongs to another as they would care for it themselves, or do with it as they would do with it themselves. You know, when somebody gives you if somebody were to say, oh, oh you're, going to the, you're going to the store. Here, here let, let me give you some money. Would you bring me back a gallon of milk? It would be extraordinarily inappropriate for you to go to the store and buy yourself a bag of dog food. Well, buy your dog a bag of dog food, actually, I guess. It would really be inappropriate if you bought yourself a bag of dog food. <laughs> but you get, you get the picture. That's what stewardship is about. It's caring for that which belongs to another as they would care for it or use it themselves. Randy Alcorn said this, says stewardship isn't a subcategory of the Christian life. Stewardship is the Christian life for what is stewardship, but that God has entrusted to us life, time, talents, money, possessions, and family. In each case, He evaluates how we regard and what we do with what He has entrusted to us. Everything about our life, everything good in our life, the Bible says every good and perfect gift comes from above. Everything in our life, we are simply stewards of, not owners of. And that changes how we spend our money at the store. And it should change how we live our daily lives. Well, today I want to give you three truths about stewardship. First of all, stewardship is about trusting God. There are probably no greater verses in all the Bible to demonstrate this truth than our passage in Proverbs chapter 3. We start out and it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your paths straight. Here he says, do not lean on your own understanding. The picture, the picture conveyed here with the word lean is to lean on something for support. I am depending on this wall to keep me from falling. I wouldn't lean on that chair like this. I might sit on it, but I wouldn't lean on it because I'm not sure I could depend on it. You could say this, a, 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 an NFL team, most of them lean heavily on their quarterbacks to, win, to, to cause them to win games. They can't do everything, of course, but they lead. They lean on their quarterbacks. They depend on their quarterbacks. And that's what he's saying here. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not depend on your own understanding. The word understanding means comprehension. The capacity for, for logically understanding thought. So the paraphrase to that would, could be like this. Don't depend on your ability to figure things out when you're making decisions. Don't depend on your ability to figure things out when you're making decisions. Because God has... Our ways are not His ways. His ways are not our ways. When we lean on God, when we acknowledge Him in all our ways, that's when we start making right decisions that result in beneficial and desirable consequences. When we lean on our understanding, when we depend on our own, our, own under, our own ability to figure things out while we're making decisions, well, we've all been there and we've all lived with the consequences, undesirable as they are. The real, reality of it is that God always knows what's best. That makes it a real good idea to ask Him when it's time to make a decision. But God's methods don't always make sense to us logically. For example, this biblical principle. 
we learn from the Bible that being a good steward means that you can actually live better on less. They don't teach that at one Wall Street. To our logical under, our logical understanding, that doesn't make sense. But what they teach on Wall Street does make sense. But what God teaches makes dollars. Sorry, I had to do it. I really, I started not to do that. <laughs> but but it, it, it's, it's true. We can live on less and live better following a biblical model. And I'm going to show you an example a little later. The math doesn't <clears throat> make S-E-N-S-E. The math doesn't make sense, but as you begin to lean on God's understanding for, fi for your finances, you find out that Wall Street's method is faulty. And God's works. But you have to try it to find out. While many of us are probably familiar with uh, the verses we've been reading, verses 5 and 6, we probably are not as familiar with verses 9 and 10. Obviously, it's just a few verses down. Here we're talking about trusting in the Lord and not leaning on our understanding and acknowledging Him in all our ways. But now there's an application, a few verses later, of, uh, of a particular part of our lives where we do that. Where we refuse to lean on our own understanding and instead we acknowledge God's ways and we adopt them. An actual... Application. This is the principle, and now in verses 9 and 10 you get the application. And here it is. It says, Honor the Lord from your wealth, and from the first of all your produce, so your barns will be filled with plenty. He's just said a few verses earlier to not to, not to depend on your own ability to figure things out when you're making decisions, and now He gives you an example of what kind of decisions to apply that principle to. Finances. It says, honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first of all your produce so your barns will be filled with plenty. Well, now we're going to use that as we go into our second truth about stewardship, which is stewardship is about honoring God. I mean, that's what our verse said. Honor the Lord. The word honor means to show forth God's worth by the way I live my life. When to honor God is to live our lives in such a way that people think highly of God because of what they see in us. <clears throat> Excuse me. The idea is that everything I have, including my money and my possessions, everything has been entrusted to me by God to be used for His honor. Everything that God... Remember, every good and perfect gift comes from above. Everything that God has put into my life and into my hands, the way I handle those things ought to make people think more of Him. Make th people think well of Him. Well, our, the beginning of our, our first verses here says, Honor the Lord from your wealth. And, and I, I think I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking, Woo, thank goodness that doesn't apply to me because I don't have wealth. <laughs> I'm not wealthy. Any of you think that you're going to get out of this by thinking that? <laughs> well, obviously the answer is no. Because the word wealth in the Bible means possessions. There's a website. And I want to encourage you when you go home to go to it. And I'll show you what... Some examples here. It's called Glo uh, Global Rich List. Strange website. Global Rich List. What you can do, it, it's not a list of all the ri people's richest, uh, the world's richest people like you might be thinking. It's a website where you can go to, plug in your income, and it will tell you where you stand in the world. In the world's 7 billion plus people. You're about to be surprised. Here's the... That's, that's what the, the home page looks like. And, and you can select location and then you enter your net income. Well, for, for a couple examples, I'm going to give you two. 
The first one is a mere $25,000. For a family of two, for a couple, I think that's about the poverty level. But in America, $25,000. Here I am. I once chose U.S. dollars and I entered $25,000. That's where it puts you. With the rest of the people of the world. Bottom corner, you're in the top 2% richest people in the world. That means that about 98% of the world's people are poorer than you if you make $25,000 a year. Let's double that to a reasonable 50000 99.69% of the world's people are poorer than you if you make 50000 a year. In one hour, you make $26.04. An average laborer in Zimbabwe makes $0.53 cents in that same hour. You earn 50000 in one year. It would take the average laborer in Indonesia 67 years to make that. He'd have to work till 2085 to accumulate having made your $50,000. 2085. <coughs> your monthly income could pay the monthly salaries of 218 doctors in Kyrgyzstan. You might think, oh, well, that's Indonesia and Kyrgyzstan. Those are real people. Those are real countries full of real people that don't have a clue what it would be like to make $50,000. I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I'm trying to make you feel good. Randy Alcorn said this, we will be held accountable for what we do in this life with what He has been entrusted to us. We are to honor God by faithfully managing what He has entrusted to us for His glory. Well, how do I do that? Well, let's go to 1 Timothy and, and see what Paul wrote to young Timothy. He said, Instruct those who are rich. You may be thinking, well, I'm not rich. <laughs> I beg to differ. I don't have wealth. I beg to differ. We do. Instruct those who, those who are rich in the present world not to be con conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Uh, to, I'm not trying to make you feel bad about your position in the world or mine. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and to be ready to share, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future. Like Jesus said, store up your treasures in heaven where, nothing can, where you can't lose them so that they may take hold of that which is life Indeed. Wow, what a phrase. Using our money biblically helps us to take hold of what is real living. That's not the Wall Street model. I want to give you two important phrases about how we honor God with our money and our, our possessions <clears throat> from this passage. And the verse may surprise you. And I have them underlined there. It means to enjoy. It means to find, the pleasure, find pleasure in the benefit of something. Paul, even though he's encouraging biblical model, a biblical model for us by extension, he's also including that we are to enjoy it. And there's nothing wrong with that. Or we wouldn't be instructed to do so. Well, you may be thinking, and there are, there are some people that, that say things like this, oh, well, money's the root of all evil. Well, I mean, actually, that, that, th those words actually say, uh, mean money is the root of all kinds of evil. 
but that's an, that's not a, a that's out of context. In fact, there there's the short portion that people like to say this is the New American Standard. Money is a root of all sorts of evil. But that's not really what the verse says. That's just what people repeat. The verse says in a little more uh, 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 fullness says this: for the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. It's not money. It's the love of money. That's totally different. But I want to, before we leave this and go back to our our passage and where we were before, I want to make sure you read the whole verse. Because it's applicable for our, 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 in our teaching here. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. And some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. So the idea of the biblical model teaching us that we can live better on less by following, not that we should, I'm not saying that you, that you go tell your boss you want to drop in pay. Has any boss ever been <laughs> approached with that? That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that we use the biblical model which, would, which instructs us to use more, some of our money in ways other than on ourselves. And so what we spend on ourselves would be less. And that biblical model tells us that living on less of your income will help you live better than if you lived on all of your income. And by longing for money, by loving money, the the, the two things in the same verse, and by loving money and longing for it, some have even wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. All you have to do is talk to somebody that, that, that counsels people with financial problems. And the list of many griefs is as long as your arm. But not only is money not evil, it's supposed to be enjoyed as long as it's put in its proper perspective. Some Christians with a holier-than-thou mentality will try to make you feel guilty for enjoying material things. Let me give you a liberating truth here. Material things are gifts of God to be enjoyed. If you buy your son or your daughter a bicycle, you tell them, take care of it, but don't enjoy it. No, of course not. You tell them to take care of it while they enjoy it. To treat it properly while they have fun with it. And it's a similar thing. We're told that we to enjoy that which God has given us. If there was something wrong with Him giving it to us, He wouldn't do so. The point is that money is to be enjoyed in life, but money is not to be the joy of life. <clears throat> First Timothy, again, put the verse back up there. The, the second phrase is to be generous. The idea there, and if you've been around here for a long time, you've, you've probably seen this. Well, that, that means that when we taught sometime back, our first week of our This Is Us series, we taught on our four values. One of those four values, the third of those four values, is generous living. And generous living means that we ha- that those things that God has entrusted to us, we hold them loosely. The idea is on our fingertips. And the statement that we use there for generous living is that we live ready to make a difference in the lives of others with what God has given us. So we hold it loosely. Instead of holding out like this and giving a little bit, we hold it loosely with looking for the opportunity to benefit somebody else. That's, that's what generous living is like. And to be generous here, the idea is to be open-handed, ready to distribute something. And, and I want to give you three keys to honoring God, God as a good steward that allow you to enjoy what God has entrusted to you 
and to live generously. Those two things, to enjoy what God has given and to be generous while we're at it. First of all, budget to live joyfully. Uh, Proverbs says this, says the plans of the diligent lead surely to, it, to, to advantage, but everyone who is hasty comes, comes surely to poverty. The idea here, plans, the Hebrew word there uh, is being intentional about doing something. So he's saying be intentional about doing something by, by, make, by making plans about it. And then it says to the advantage, that means simply a benefit, a favorable position, a favorable outcome of something. So the idea is that wisdom demands that I manage my money with an intentional purpose and promises that when I do, I'll be in a more advantageous financial position. Now you're saying, but what you're suggesting is that we spend more money on something other than our, myself or ourselves. How in the world am I going to be end up in a more financially advantageous position. Well, first of all, let me just address the second part. It says, who is hasty comes to poverty. The idea of being hasty is someone that makes an a, a urgent decision uh, that without giving it plans. Well, I'm going to give you an example a little bit later, but I want you to hang on to the question I just asked. How does spending some of my money that God has entrusted to me on something other than myself, put me in a better financial situation. Secondly, uh, of our different ways that we're going to uh, live for being a, the, the principles of living a, a life of a steward is to save for the future wisely. Art Rayner quotes a Federal Reserve study that says this about the people of America. Quote, in the U.S., most would not be able to pay for a financial emergency that cost more than four hundred dollars. Wow! Could you turn the air on? Proverbs from the New Living Translation says this in chapter twenty-one. It says, "The wise have wealth and luxury, but the fools spend whatever they get." Wow. But living within our means doesn't simply mean that we. Don't spend what we earn. It means from a biblical perspective that it means that we also save for the future. Because it's the, the, the wisdom of saving allow us to have wealth, possessions. And, and in this case, even luxury. But the fools spend whatever they get. Thirdly, to give to the Lord generously. Back to our passage. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 9 and 10 says this, Honor the Lord from the wealth, from your possessions, you don't have to be what you would consider wealthy for this to apply to you. It says, honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first of all your produce. So, or so that, your barns will be filled with plenty. Two important words here, and I have them underlined. First and produce. The word produce means an increase or uh, uh, in, in revenue. And the word first doesn't mean chronologically. It means best. Choicest. The, the, the chief of the options. The highest of the options available. So the idea isn't that we just give chronologically first, which I, I do because it just simplifies everything. but also from the best. Out of every source of income, you and I are to generously give first to the Lord's work to honor Him. That which is best. That means that I don't take care of me first and then see what's left over. And you know the dollars here in those two different Approaches could be exactly the same. Let me, let me tell you, show you what I mean. We could, first of all, when we say, for instance, when we get a paycheck, we could say, Lord, I trust you. Therefore, that which you have entrusted to me, I give a portion back to you according to what, how I feel you have, how, how, to the degree you have called me to give. 
the standard, you know, t the word tithe, basically most people understand that is 10%. But it's not as, as cut and dried as you might think as far as a, an actual percentage. But it's a good place to start. And you could say, Lord, I trust you and I'm going to show it by taking this percentage of what you have given me and give it through my church to accomplish your mission. And then I'm going to depend on you that the rest of what I have will make it to the end of the month. And the, those dollars, whatever they happen to be, say uh, say a thousand dollars, take a hundred, and you then, then and then you use nine hundred to live off of and are saved. Well, based on point number two, like, and save. <laughs> we'll talk about that in a second too. Or you could take the first ninety percent and live off of it and save and then give the same 10% at the end. Dollars are the same. Going to the same places for the same purposes. But that's not like trusting the Lord. Trusting God is to say, Lord, every good and perfect gift comes from You. And I know You are going to provide my need according to your riches and glory, that won't, go, won't ever go bankrupt. And so, I trust you, and I'm going to show you that I trust you by giving the best, the first, the highest. And then I trust you with the rest. Well, <clears throat> Dave Ramsey, as you, you, may, you may recognize... Dave Ramsey, he's the guy that developed and has the whole ministry and website of Financial Peace University, which, by the way, um, we are talking about uh, offering that in 2019. Uh, there, there's a couple different avenues that we might take, different people have talked to about how we might go about this, but uh, one way or another, we're going to be offering that. And I want you to know, if you go to his website, you'll see that when people follow the, the model that he has, it, it's you know, sometimes called like the 80-10-10, or, or the 10 10 80, I should say. And that is where you take 10% and you give it to God. You give it through your church for the purpose of accomplishing it. You take another 10% and you save it. Then you take 80% and you live off of it. Well, and, that, and that, those numbers change through the different steps of the process of the Financial Peace University. But that that's just gives you a gist of the, 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 the model there. But people who follow his, his uh, system, the average family that goes through it, and many people are in desperate straits when they sign up, the average family is completely out of debt, including their home, in seven years. Some of you are thinking that's impossible. There are a lot of people that do his, that follow his, mes his method. It honors God and it provides for living and it provides for saving. And the average family that goes through it seven years, how many of you would like to have your home, your cars, and everything else paid for in seven years? Come on, let's get real here. You, okay, well, the three of you that would like to see that happen in your life, <laughs> it can. But Dave Ramsey quotes the, the great evangelist John Wesley and, and says this, says, the great evangelist John Wesley said, if you give 10% and save 10% and live on 80%, you will always have a good life. You'll retire with dignity, you'll have a good spiritual walk, and you're at least tithing 10%. Well, now to our third truth about stewardship. And that is, stewardship is about receiving from God. Two more important words from our verses, verses 9 and 10, are this, Honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first of your produce, so your barns will be filled with plenty. I know there are a lot of preachers out there that, you know, call them health and wealth, prosperity preachers, whatever, whatever you want to call them. And, and th this is the focus of their ministry. They, they talk nothing else, they talk about hardly nothing else, but what you can get. And, and they play on 
people's desires and greed and get them to give them money in an attempt to try to get rich off of God. Well, that's, that's not the idea. Of, that's not the biblical model. The uh, biblical model is that when we truly honor God first, He sees to it that our barns are filled with plenty. <clears throat> Even though the dollar num- the numbers may be less. And by the way, that means fewer taxes. Boy, I can't even get an amen on that. Lower taxes? I can't even sell lower taxes today? <laughs> Excuse me. The word filled here means the act of making that which was empty to be no longer empty. So, so that make your barns, even though they be empty or under furnished, that they now be fully furnished. And the word plenty means abundance. It's just what you would think. <clears throat> God wants us to be like this. He wants us to honor Him with, that, with His possessions that He has entrusted to us. To honor Him. And then as a result, He builds into our obedience those consequences. This is a good arrangement, people. <laughs> this is... But not only is it beneficial for us, It's how God fuels His mission to reconcile men, women, boys, and girls unto Himself and to make us happy along the way. God has a plan. He doesn't need Wall Streets and He doesn't need ours. He's got a plan and it's a good one. And it works. God's saying basically, trust me, honor me, and I'll provide for you. I'm about to get into some very uncomfortable stuff here. You'll understand why as I go as I get into it. But you but but I think you need to know two things. And they'll be they'll come to light in and throughout this. When Neil and I became Christians, we made a decision that we would honor the Lord with what he gave us. And we have the personal conviction for us. It's a personal conviction. This is not a, a commandment from God. This is, and it might not apply to you, but this is our personal conviction that God wants us to give more than 10%. So some time back, we worked our way up to, and this is the really awkward part, but you need to know that it works. Nell and I, for quite some time, give 20% of our income through this church. And I, want to t- and I want to tell you how I know this works. We are on track to be 100% out of debt before the end of next year. You know, I mentioned this last week. 100% out of debt. Oh, no, you know, groceries and obviously and everything. And even though we have been working towards getting ourselves out of debt now in less than a year, it only takes half of our, not gross, but it only takes half of our take-home pay to pay all of our bills, including groceries and gas. Less than 50 per, we live on less than for 50% of our take-home pay. That 80-10-10 thing, living off of 80% is a good thing. But because we have been doing our best to follow biblical models, imperfect as we are at it, less than 50% now goes towards our daily living. Every one of our bills. Now, <clears throat> you, some of you that know our, our living circumstances and so forth, you say, well, yeah, well, your circumstances are different. Our, you know, because we, we live in a, in, in a place that allows us to live at a, very affordably. No, it's not government subsidized, just in case that's what you're thinking. <laughs> but I would say to that, yes, we do. 
And that is part of how God has provided and, and recognized that we are trying to honor Him in the way He has instructed us. And that is how, that is one of the ways He has made it possible for us to live, to have the freedom, the financial freedom to be generous with our money. Don't you like giving people money? It, it's, it's fun. And if you follow God's model, He'll free you your money up so you can do so. But the, I can tell you this, the decision to honor God with the first and the best and the choices of our income came before Him giving us the circumstances that allow us to live very affordably. A closing point would be that it, you know, it seems like there's a, a, a circle that just picks up steam. It starts with, with trusting God. And we trust God and we, and we do basically what we've heard here. We, we, put, we put finances in the right place. We, we first we recognize who owns it and then we start becoming stewards of it instead of owners. And we start following a more biblical model. And then after that, we, we start... Literally, we, we, we start honoring God with what we do. And then as a result, we benefit, we receive from God. And having received from God, we're, we're more capable to start the circle over, to trust God for more. And, and then to honor God with more. And because of our actions, we end up, and His, His response to our actions, we end up trusting God for more. And I can tell you, there are some things just right on the horizon for Nell and I that are going to free us up even more. I'll, have, I'll be glad to talk to you about this later, but we are about to live in a place that doesn't cost us anything. Even our utilities. And I can tell you where to sign up for this. <laughs> it's by following a biblical model. And, and, and not only... Well, no, I'm not going to go there. Well, let me encourage you. Let, let's, let's, let's wrap it up here. Again, this is a... It's, it's a difficult topic and it gets uncomfortable. But you need to know that it works. It does. You can talk to other people in this congregation that have a similar story. I'm not the only one. Let's pray.